Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology turn podcast. Everyone, welcome into the program today. I hope that you're ready for today's program because, yeah, you guessed it, we have Nathan Evans. He is, of course, managing editor over at popzara.com. And ladies and gentlemen, if you have not heard one of our segments, they're always a lot of fun. We encourage you to, uh, you know, not just listen to our segment, but check out their whole site. You know, they have, uh, he helps with, uh, I'm sorry, he has help with a huge team of writers and editors and, you know, just reviews. Viewers, they do everything from pop culture, uh, movies, video games, technology reviews, a little bit of everything for the discerning audience. Now, with that being said, we'll join uh, in with him in just a moment. But before we do, ComputerAmerica.com, as you will find everything, including past shows, future shows, show notes, articles, reviews, topics, um, for every conversation that we have here on the program, as well as uh, social media links, contests, and giveaways. So, everyone, and, uh, you know, surprisingly, yes, there's even a Twitter link. We did not get banned, and... uh, yeah, we're very grateful for that. So uh, we'll see if we can change that here in the short, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks. With that being said, everyone, uh, why don't we go ahead and bring Nathan on and just have a fun little conversation to wrap up your Friday afternoon. Everyone, welcome on to the program once again. He is managing editor popzara.com, and of course, he helps us with big events. And of course, every Friday, or I should say, last Friday of every month, joins us to talk about a little bit of everything. It's uh, the potpourri segment here on uh, on Computer America. Nathan, how you doing? Hey Ben, what's going on? And uh, I think we talked about this. Apologies if you hear any background noise. And by noise, I mean horrible, horrible pop music. I am <laughs> traveling, and they are playing the station from hell. But, but if you can't hear it, then, well, I, I envy you. No, but, uh, Luckily, we thanks, don't. Ben. And ladies and gentlemen, if you do hear that, you are you are not about to miss your plane. That is all, Nathan. Uh-huh. He's traveling, so uh, you know we can we can excuse that. You sound great. We don't hear any of the background mm-hmm. noise. So, looking forward to mm-hmm. this. Before we get started, Nathan, why don't we go ahead and uh, just you know I try to give a little introduction, but uh, tell us about what you do over at popzara.com. What do I do? Well. I mean, what do you need? What do you got? No, <laughs> it's, a, it's a website. It has a dinosaur mascot. We do games. We do technology. We do movies. We do a lot of books. We do podcasts. We do a little of that. Um, I wouldn't say we're the most up-to-date, but we're pretty great. I think that rhymes. That's a good, yeah. that's a good catch slogan. Like, we're number something. <laughs> no, but uh, we have a really good team. As you've met most, you've met many of them. Uh, we mm-hmm. do a lot with events. Uh, the pandemic's over, so we hope to do some more of that. Um, uh, trying to think. I'm, I've been on your show dozens and do- maybe a hundred times, maybe less. <laughs> I don't know, right about it. I haven't like kept it. count, but yeah, you've, you've been, you've, you've definitely been a long serving correspondent and we definitely appreciate that. And like I said, it, it's always a, it's always a pleasure because we get to talk about things that maybe don't, uh, come up in our day to day coverage of tech news and, you know, uh, interviews and things like that, which, uh, I really appreciate because you're very mm-hmm. knowledgeable on, uh, on so many things and you, uh, I don't think you do it on purpose. I think that's just the way you are. You have uh, a different uh, opinion about a lot of this that uh, you know a lot of our other guests don't seem to have. Huh. So, um, not saying that you are purposely adversarial. I'm saying that uh, <laughs> you are unique, and uh, well, don't forget that. As Confucius once said, "Only dead fish go with the flow." But <laughs> the truth is, is that no. I mean, the truth is, I'm I'm not a cynic. Like a lot of people think, oh, you're just a contrarian. Not at all. It's just that sometimes one gets a little tough because with technology, and I think you would agree, that with technology, we kind of, uh, we all do this. Like we all want to do what's popular. We want to talk. I mean, that's why I'm here right now. We're not talking about news from a month ago. We're going to talk about news news that was recent, right? Yeah. So, because we want to sort of get onto that juicy SEO goodness. I mean, who <laughs> wouldn't want to get onto that? But at the end of the day, though, when technology, sometimes I think we all have a tendency to have groupthink a little bit because we all say, 
you know, oh, well, that must be true. Like, well, that, that must be a good reason. That must be. And we try to, you know, criticizing and trying to examine things from a different perspective isn't necessarily cynical. It's realistic. And, it's, and sometimes it's easy. Sometimes you see everyone else doing one thing and you, do, well, you want to do it the other way just to see what's going on over there, just to peek. And sometimes you do agree with everybody. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes groupthink is right. For example, clean water is better than dirty water. Who would have thought? <laughs> but, 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 but I guess, I guess maybe your longtime listeners, I think you would agree that sometimes that means politics, but it doesn't mean politics in the way that would divide you. It just means politics are involved and you want to try to steer around it comfortably without offending anybody because no one wants to be offended. And if you do go on Twitter, wink, but <laughs> But no, you know, we you wanna you wanna you wanna keep things interesting. If you had me on and all I talked about was parroting things, and I don't think you'd have me on very much. Yeah, it, it, it's um, you know once a month. I'm not saying that's enough, but I'm saying that uh, yeah, that's uh, that certainly gives us an opportunity to kind of recap the month. And while we do try to stick to the you know more what's happening yeah. in the week thing, still we have fun. Now, with that being said, I wanted to kind of jump into the topics of the day. You picked out a couple. I picked out like mm-hmm. four or five stories myself. And let's be honest, uh, we like had some two, overlap. There was a little the, overlap. Yeah, yeah, th- there was quite a bit of overlap, so I think we start with that, and uh, I think we start with the obvious because late last night, <laughs> if, if you were tr- if you were scrolling through your Twitter feed or going on any news site, uh, the yes, Nathan's chuckling maniacally. The ever awaited, forever put off, uh, you know, the Musk trying to tank the deal for a couple months finally went through and yeah twitter has a new ceo well i should i guess i should say owner i don't know if musk has uh, well, promoted himself to ceo but yeah musk owns he, i think twitter. he has i think i think he has but um no i mean uh, let's get the obvious out of the way this has been a long time coming but how you look at his strategy i think depend is two ways one either he's playing four-dimensional chess which doesn't exist or he's doing a hail mary and seeing where things go and I think a lot of these people like Musk who are, you know, that have, that are sort of gifted in, in the way they promote themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, some, sometimes it's like looking at a very fancy painting. I don't know if you ever remember that story where the art critic goes up and goes, Oh, wonderful, wonderful. This artist is so talented. And it turns out they're looking at like a kindergartner scribbles. Yes. Like you, anybody can see Jesus and potato chips if they stare hard enough. Musk has been very successful on a lot of things. I have been very, very, very critical of him on this show many times. Mm-hmm. You know this. Yeah. Um, I've, I've come around a little bit simply because he's so entertaining, but as far as his Twitter acquisition, which is, I guess is official now, I guess he's bumped off. Um, I forget the names of the people he, uh, poo pooed, but he didn't, he, he walked into the office carrying a kitchen sink. So the metaphor is there. (laughs) He, uh, he, uh, he, he went in and, uh, he's replacing, uh, Parag uh, uh, Agrawal, which I'm sure I butchered that, um, mm-hmm. and he's also over, and he pretty much fired the CEO and I think the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer, uh, and, and really he went in just kind of saying, uh, well, actually before the deal even closed, I might be getting ahead of myself. He said mm-hmm. that, uh, well, at least he told investors, he didn't you know tell everyone, but he told investors that I'm planning on firing 75 percent of Twitter's workforce, yeah. and I guess no one really saw it coming although I guess they should have the number one, number two jobs that were canned were the CFO and the CEO. So by the way, he has uh, updated his profile to call himself chief twit. So chief twit. there you the, go. Uh, and there, the, one of the, one of the, the people that was fired was one of the, was the, one of the enforcers for safety and, and whatnot. And I think she was the one who was responsible. And, and I say responsible as in they, she took very much credit for it for banning Donald Trump from the platform. And I think this is one of those things where I'll have a different opinion. Um, th- there's going to be a very, very important election coming up in the next couple mm-hmm. weeks here in the United States. And some people have questioned the timing of the mood that someone like uh, Tr- uh, Musk, who is, an, you know, who is an admitted Trump supporter, would reinstate Donald Trump weeks before the election, uh, which is ironic, you know, considering how he was, you know, boosted from the, the platform. Yeah. And I don't really think that has anything to do with it. I think the timing is what it is, but there's rumors that Trump will be back on Twitter, but this weekend we'll see, we'll see. Um, he has the- his own social media network. He has truth social. So <laughs> I, and, and, and by the way, this whole deal with Elon Musk and Twitter, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This takes Twitter private, right? Like he, he, 
he gets you know sole control over it. I'm sure him and his investors, and it's no longer going to be subject to. Uh, I don't know. You know, uh, investors and things. I I think he's taking it private, like completely like, off possible. the stock market. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, the last time a major company did something like that that actually helped the company was Dell Computers. Yeah. You know, and Michael Dell rebought the repurchased the company. He did wonderful things with it. I would say that was the smartest thing he's ever done. Um, again, Musk is an I- interesting person. He's willing to play fast and loose with mo- money. I know there's some. There was a lot well, of stories that he couldn't afford, but. There's fast and loose, Nathan, and then I'm going to ask you, (laughs) was this a good deal? Did did Elon Musk Um, make the right decision? And yeah. I was having a conversation yesterday about World War II with a friend. And someone (laughs) asked, like, why did it, you know, why did the United States get into the war? And my friend's like, freedom. And I said, well, sure. But what's the real reason? Like, freedom is sort of a byproduct of what the real reason was. You know, because we don't necessarily, you know, do things simply because it's the right thing to do. We have to have justification and motive for it. Um, you know, Trump, uh, excuse me, Musk, I should say, was very vocal on Twitter. Uh, he, he literally pinged the audience and said, should I do this? Should I have this? And he was very cryptic. And his whole explanation was, is, and I quote, um, I'm going to unlock Twitter's potential, unleash it. And a lot of people have said, well, what does that mean? And I think if you were to go to any website right now that's a technology website, I think you'll find negative opinions about Musk buying Twitter. Mm. And I think, I think the fact that the consensus is that him buying Twitter by these websites was a bad thing for freedom of speech is an interesting take. The idea that somehow enabling people to speak their mind is somehow hurting free speech. And the, you know, the, the simple answer is, oh, he's, he's going to let back on hate speech people. He's going to let back on Nazis. He's going to let back on this. Yeah, but he might let he might let like comedians back on. That said something. Like that. I, I, he might let people. Well, back. he also models himself uh, sort of comedian. I remember uh, one of the quotes yes. he tweeted today was uh, he says something like, "Effective immediately, I am banning all females off the platform." That was that was like one of his tweets today. Um, I mean, he's I clearly mean, a joke, yeah, but he, yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's he's become like I said, he's become uh, enamored with himself, like. I remember when Elon Musk was a guest on The Simpsons, and he gave, quite honestly, the worst performance I've ever heard on The Simpsons, but he's gotten better. Like, he's gotten better. I think it was his performance on Joe Rogan mm-hmm. with, when he was smoking the stogie. Like, yeah. I think that's where he, he kind of got his groove, and he's become, <laughs> he has become, for better or for worse, the heir apparent in our society to someone like Steve Jobs. He's become the definitive inventor slash entrepreneur. I would say that, that he, he, he is one of the highest profile uh posters he he is uh very uh, like what richard branson stopped you know just short yeah. of elon musk has oh, yeah. dove headfirst into exactly like this is a guy who named tesla's like mechanic mechanics after space balls you know yes and has and has flamethrowers and trucks that look like nintendo 64 graphics you know he's going to space and he's doing money systems i mean this is a guy who is invested in the culture and I think he wants the culture to be invested in him, you know, reciprocally. And I think you can count on, like, maybe two hands the number of people that have defined those moments in the United States, you know, as entrepreneurials. I, you have someone like Ford, you have Edison, um, and despite what Musk would say, no Tesla. Tesla never rose to that level. But you have <laughs> someone like Walt Disney, you know, you have someone like Steve Jobs. Uh, you have these people. Um, I forget who did Kodak, um, or Polaroid, was it Land? Mr. Atlanta, Kodak, I think. yes, yes, Mr. Kodak. No, but, but, um, but what I mean, though, is that you have, now you have Musk, for better force, you're probably using PayPal. You know, you're probably using, you know, you're using something of a service. I mean, I saw three Teslas today. You know, yeah. you, have, you have someone who's interesting. Whether you agree with him or not, it's different, but he is interesting. Um, I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, because I do believe, as I was saying before, final thought, is that if you look at the consensus on these websites that are saying that Musk buying Twitter is going to unleash this, unleash hell, well, I hope so. Because, yeah, the, um, I hope Twitter, it does. I hope it does unleash hell. Twi- Twitter, um, uh, Facebook, and a lot of these other social media sites. Like, and and one of our other topics is going to be Facebook and, and Meta, so we can talk about that uh, here in a minute. But uh, a lot of, a lot of good news there. There's uh, there's been such a it seems like almost stagnation in development. It's like they got mm-hmm. um, especially when it comes to Facebook and Meta, they got this massive market share, and then it seemed like they were playing catch up with, you know, uh, what can we have on the platform? What does this look like? Blah blah blah. And like there was not a lot of innovation. It was more like 
uh, just mass moderation. And by the way, uh, just some highlights here from uh, this article that we have here. Uh, by the way, definitely, 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 the, uh, the New York Stock Exchange filed to delist Twitter, and Elon mm-hmm. Musk has purchased every share for fifty four point uh, fifty four. 20 so 420 5420 um yeah so of it course. is going private yeah. and musk owns the whole dang thing so well, well you know him and whoever loaned him well, the 44 billion dollars i've always felt it was strange i always thought that twitter was the most egregiously run company i've ever seen this is a company that had unfathomable reach but yet was stymied by its own creator uh jack dorsey mm-hmm. who became just a pretentious pompous ass and and what's funny is that he agrees with musk like once he was out of that you know once he was out of the responsibility and you know he didn't he wasn't beholden to his shareholders he endorsed musk buying of course he did but he even <laughs> endo- he even admitted he made a lot of money mistakes, yeah. he made mistakes but i mean but but i think there's some truth to that i think dorsey is one of those people that which i found out that he was a failed model that he really he dreamt of being a model didn't work yeah and he positioned himself but again um musk is better than dorsey I'm better than Dorsey. You're better than Dorsey. So <laughs> Thank anyone, you. anyone, but you have these, you have a 300 million, you know, 300 million user base. It didn't do anything. There was no innovation. It was stagnant. And their, their only claim to fame was banning people. I mean, I, I, look, you want to ban a politician because they say something truly offensive, like anti-Semitic or racist. That's prerogative of, of a free speech model, as you know. And I think you and I differ slightly that the idea that, that private companies can ban people for whatever reason Mm-hmm. I think, and forgive me if I'm miscategorizing you, but I think you feel that that should be, and I, I'm a little more like libertarian on it. But the I, fact I, that I, is, I, have, I have come around to the idea that uh, moderation does not equal censorship. You know, the the two are very well, different, and promoting exactly. conversation is important. So, yeah. Well, I think I think you can have those policies, but they need to be enforced fairly. And I Tra- pretty clear. Transparency if, is pretty big. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, uh, to continue this whole mm-hmm. Musk Twitter thing, yeah. Musk says he's forming a content moderation council. So he is, he is cognizant that there has to of be course. some kind of outward appearance that there's going to be uh, a separate division or, you know, there's going to be a group of people who are going to decide what should and should not be on the platform. Now, is that going to be as strict as Twitter has been in the past? Definitely, definitely not. <laughs> but there's still going to be some form of moderation. It, it's not freedom as I think, you know, a lot of people think Twitter's no, going to no, be. No, no, no. Well, again, I mean, I mean, freedom doesn't mean freedom of responsibility. Of course, it means right. moderation. And I think a lot of what he's going to do is to satisfy like Euro, Euro guidelines because they're a little different than we are. And unless he wants to pull up a shop and ban Twitter from, you know, European markets, he's going to have to understand that their laws are a little different. They're a little more fascistic than I would say American laws are. But, but again, um, yeah. the, what I was going to say, though, but it doesn't mean like you can say anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic remarks or it doesn't mean you can say that and not be res- free from that. It doesn't mean, oh, you don't like it, just ban somebody. I mean, I, I understand this. But we were never talking about that. We were never talking about that. What we were talking about I, I feel is like you're hinting at like some, what happened with Kanye. No, actually, I don't really care about Kanye. Kanye, <laughs> Kanye, I don't think is very interesting. Kanye has been suffering a breakdown for like what fifteen years, and again, people tolerate. Like, this is interesting. That's a mental you know health thing. You're right. You're right. I'll, I'll say this about Kanye. Like, I remember when Kanye would require like podcasts to give him eight minutes of unrestricted. There's clips of him like on the Jimmy Fallon show where he's not allowed to be interrupted. People played by Kanye's foolishness because Kanye said said the right things politically the moment kanye stopped being in the right camp politically is all of a sudden it's a mental health crisis let's institutionalize him let's ban him i don't agree with what he says i never agree with what he says but let's not act like what kanye's rants weren't permissible when he agreed with them and that's kind of what twitter was twitter's like you can go on twitter right now and i can find you the most heinous things you've ever heard i could find you anti-semitism anti-semitism i can find you racism i can find you everything you want that's a million times worse than anything that someone banned was said. However, they, they don't have to the be audience the that right Kanye band. does. Yeah, they don't have the audience. Well, that, again, it's it's sort of like you know you ban something like the Babylon Bee, who's a, a satire site, right? Because they had made a joke, but you don't ban satire sites that are much worse. It's you have you have this strange strange way of moderation that does not add up to fairness, and people say, well, you don't have to be fair. But you say you are. And again, if Kanye, if Kanye, excuse me, Kanye, you ain't fixing it, go buy parlor, Kanye. But, but 
if Musk can fix that, then he's already done a better job. I mean, I mean, I don't want to be unoffended. Then I don't care. Like me, I can handle. I don't need. I don't need a, a trigger warning, right? I know it's yeah. offensive. It's online. You know, I trust me. I've seen the online world, but at the same time, I don't actively seek out content to be to be offended so I can complain. Um, I'll say this, Elon Musk, if you're listening, I have one request because this is something that Twitter has been devoid of for years and uh, they've avoided it. And I'm mm-hmm. going to tell you this, your audience is not going to believe me, but Twitter doesn't seem to care about pedophilia. They have, they have no way of reporting it. There's nothing. Mm. I can report someone being misgendered, but I, it, it, I have to go through hoops to report pedophilia. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's ridiculous that it's taken this long. Twitter, Elon, if you can put if you could put a way to combat pedophilia on Twitter, then you will already have gotten you should win the Nobel Peace Prize because it is insane that one of the largest social media networks has sat around and let this go for so long. I put it in my profiles when I can. I, I see stuff like this, I see exploitation. I don't want it on there. I don't that's something that I don't think should be on there. I think we could, can we all agree on this? Can we, I think we can agree that pedophilia point. is bad. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's... It's a great starting point. We're all on board. And if you're not on board, then frankly, I don't know what to say to you, but that's it. That's, that's what I say. Yeah. Like if you could do that, Elon, then I'm on your side. Yep. Yeah, there, there's, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that there's not a thing for that, but I'm, I'm sure that there's... It's you know. shockingly difficult. It's You would not believe it. You wouldn't believe it's that yeah. difficult. You really wouldn't. Yeah. Try it. Just try it yourself. If you're listening, go try it. Just see what happens if you try to report <laughs> I, it. I, I think we're going to uh, transition a little bit here from yeah. uh, from Twitter, Elon Musk, that whole thing. And by the way, uh, the executives that he fired are going to get like a $200 million parachute. I know that people oh, are yeah, worried um, uh, about the Twitter executives, but they're going to be fine. Um, I, and again, I don't think it's happened yet, although I'm already seeing news reports in the past like 30 minutes about supposedly uh, workers leaving the Twitter uh, headquarters in like San Francisco and places like that carrying boxes so they were, uh, yeah he, they were asked they were asked to leave yeah yeah he he he, uh, he being Elon Musk did promise to fire up to 75 percent of the workforce so uh, don't be surprised if in the coming week uh, you know week or weeks you hear many 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 more layoffs there now with that being said Twitter it has its own thing because you know like every other tech company they Mm -hmm. were you know they they are started and they get their audience and they subsist on venture capital money where they just burn 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 and you know twitter has burned cash forever i think like one quarter it made the headlines because they actually made more money than they spent uh but by and large like most tech companies they don't make money they have large audiences but they don't make money now i bring that around because another large tech company that uh, can't seem to turn a profit is, well, Meta. And that's where mm-hmm. we go to this other story uh, that, you know, we're going to have here. But again, we'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, make sure that's muted. Pause that. Anyways, Meta's value has plunged by $700 billion and Wall Street calls it a train wreck. So this mm-hmm. is an, this is after another 24% drop on Thursday after earnings. They said it was, you know, missed completely. Uh, this is after they were reported to be worth about a trillion dollars back in September 2020. Now, Nathan, I want everyone to understand 2021 for tech companies was a very weird time because everything was going digital. Uh, There was this whole movement with COVID and all that and this whole transition that, you know, uh, the economy was being just totally injected with just free money from the Federal Reserve. Um, Everything Mm -hmm. was inflated by, you know, double digits. Many, many, many. But Meta... I think this is what surprises people is that Meta and Facebook by extension, you know, it's it's definitely a household name, but you cover, you know, you cover it, well, I cover it, they? we cover all the time. They don't have a good product and they don't have any good products on the horizon. Well, so I, I disagree with what you just said about them being a household name, because this is a company that had, was a household name, but the name became tarnished and they decided to change the name. They decided, you know what, Facebook let's get away Meta. from our right. scandals. Yeah, Facebook to Meta. And the last time a company did that under duress was Amway. You know, the online, the, the, basically the, scam, the scamathon retailer that basically yeah. had you recruit your friends. Oh, we're, oh, no, scandal, scandal. Change it to Quickstar. 
And if you're a giant, giant company that's one of the most recognizable names in the world and you change your name, there's a reason you change. Disney's not going to become, you know, Mouse House. They, they would destroy their credibility. Mm-hmm. But you, you're right. You're right about the other thing. Their product stinks. Their product. I don't know what their product is. Like, I, I just poo pooed Twitter. Their, let me their, go ahead their and product, see fair. Yeah, yeah. Their product should be advertising, and you know, the same thing that Google is um, is advertising. You know, that they could promise you 1.2 billion active users, but that wasn't the product. The product was the advertising that they could serve mm-hmm. to 1.2 billion. Well, uh, but even that has you know just really dwindled the, because they can't even market it right. Well, a couple things. A couple things. One. Unlike Twitter that decided I, I have this enormous mountain of data that I'm going to monetize by making, you know, product like Facebook, Meta, whatever. They had this enormous user base they were going to monetize by making phones, didn't work. By making communication devices, didn't work. Mm-hmm. By making this, didn't work. By making gaming streaming, didn't work. Nothing works. Nothing, nothing. We poo-poo Google for doing this, but man, Facebook has them beat. <laughs> like they've had, no, I don't think they've had any success besides Instagram. And even that's questionable. But you, uh, but you look at, um, I think the biggest folly that Facebook has done, I'm never going to call them meta. I'm going to, you know what, Facebook, <laughs> you made a movie called The Social Network, own it. So, well, you know, we also don't really call Google, you know, uh, uh, Alphabet. Alphabet. We, we call Google, Google. Yeah. It, Same thing. Exactly. So, uh, but anyway, what I was going to say is um, VR. Now, you know how I feel about VR, mm-hmm. but no company has, has dug a hole as deep as Facebook. They decided very early they were going to buy Lucker Palmies. Uh, Lucker Palmies, sorry. Luck, how do you say it? Palmer Lucky? Lucky Palmer? Lucky Palmer, yes. Lucky Palmer. It's, it sounds like it could be a candy or a porn name. But either way, <laughs> um, and you know how I feel about this. And I've always felt that, that v, I've told you before, and I'll say it again, that VR could work in a certain space had it been done by the right people. And there has never been a mix match of product and service more egregious and more incompatible than I Facebook read, and VR. I read a comment that someone had about you know what happened to Meta, and essentially they were like, Elon Musk is so rich, he thought he could sell nothing to people for real money. Like Instead of making a physical product, he, so, he tried to sell people nothing, and they didn't go for it. Mm-hmm. it which, which, you know, really kind of resonated with me that he was, you know, he, he surrounded himself with Did you say Musk or, did you, or uh, I, 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 might, uh, I might have said Musk. I, I meant uh, uh, Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg has so mm-hmm. much money, he tried to sell nothing to people who want something. He, and, and I really do feel that. You know, he's a technologist that I guess just bought into his own world. No, I don't. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, you, we've seen the movie, right? Which one? You know, we've seen the movie. Um, the you know the social network where the story, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, famous, yeah. Famous, famous story that that he basically stole the idea from the Winklevoss twins and all this. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think I think the truth is somewhere in between that he didn't steal, but he but he recognized the greaterness, the greaterness, the greatness of a product that the Winklevoss would have never recognized. I mean, he, by no means did he invent the social network. I mean, there was Zanga, LiveJournal, everything before then, right? right? MySpace, whatever. But he did recognize the power of the API. He recognized that the social media paradigm could change if people applied it to service, right? And he was right. He was right. And he was a bastard, and he was a thief, and he castigated anybody who, who talked bad about him. I mean, you saw the famous, um, the famous text messages from, I think, AOLIM. We call them dumb Fs, you know, dumb mucks. <laughs> and, but people don't care because the product was good. Facebook was the best social media network at the time. You know this. We all yeah. used it. And it did, and it did sort of um, colonize the internet in a way that only Google had done before, that it, it created roads, it created Facebook pathways. did this allowed, thing that, yeah. you know, you could walk up to someone and shake their hand and then walk away. Uh, and yeah. then like 30 minutes later, Facebook would be like, hey, would you like to be friends with this person yeah. that you met in person? Uh, like, yeah, they, they did that very, very well. But, you know, they haven't kept up with, I, I think, the needs well, of what people want. I, I don't think that's half. I think that's the case. But I think more egregiously is that Facebook was a vampire. Facebook said, well, you let me in. I'm in now. Now I'm in. I'm going to take control of things. It became I'm going to be your friends list. I'm going to be your chat. I'm going to be your search. I'm going to be your, your marketplace. I'm, I'm going, going to be, be your, your account on every third party yeah. service. Oh, 
And that's not all. It's like, oh, you're, I'm on your phone already. How about I just take that contact list? How do you do? You know, oh, you're standing at Walmart. You're standing looking at the pharmacy. What are you looking at? Well, I'm going to use Bluetooth. I'm going to find out what you're looking at. And then a couple of years ago, it came out that Facebook was conducting psychological tests by uh, very, without telling people, of course. Changing they were, timelines, they were yeah. Changing timelines and, and serving up news stories to, to test the psychological impact on people, which again, <laughs> I hate to say it, is against the Nuremberg Treaty. <laughs> but but the fact is they were getting away with this stuff. And then, the, again, I hate to break, beat a dead horse, but um, when it came out that they were involved in Cambridge Analytics, I get, that was the same thing as like, uh, an, um, who was it, Kanye thing. The, the hatred they had for certain politics made it a front, a bridge too far. And but I, they were I, right this time. I, I remember talking about Cambridge Analytics and, and you know, my, my comment then is still my comment now, which is to get mad at Facebook for what happened with Cambridge a- Analytica was... You know, Facebook that that's Facebook's product being used the way Facebook product well, was designed. You're right. Everything no, no, you're was exactly on right. the up and up. It's just, you know, after the fact we realized, holy crap, you know, that's a little that's I mean, a little seedy. Little politics is that I mean Cambridge Analytics was used to promote the Barack Obama campaign as well, the Hillary Clinton campaign, as well as the Trump campaign. I mean, that's what they're for. They were they were well, analytics. And they were really good at it. Yeah. And again, you said Facebook's the product. In fact, we're the product. And in a way, Zuckerberg forgot this. And, you know, all those insidious images of him, like strolling down, uh, strolling <laughs> the, down the, 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 the movie theaters. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And stuff like this. I mean, the, I mean, no offense. Someone has been misleading Zuckerberg in the way he looks. I'm not trying to try to mash on the guy's looks, but he looks creepy AF. And for a pasty little, you know, zombie man to look like that and to say, I know what's best for you is not a good look. I'm sorry. It's just not a good look. I, and, and then, you know, and I'm going to deviate from you. I think he looks like a perfectly normal person. Um, you know, though I do think that uh, we have been brainwashed to think that mm-hmm. billionaires should be sexy and billionaires should be, uh, oh, should no. have enviable looks. I think he looks just well, like a dude. I think he looks like a, a technologist. I, like, honestly. Yeah, but I don't, but I don't want someone who looks like, who looks like that. To determine to determine the style of how we interact with each other. For example, you have this MetaQuest thing, right? Yeah, and yeah. We, we don't know we don't we don't know the analytics of this or not. But when you have this sort of thing, and you know you have you have I, I don't know if you've been privy, but you've seen like the private conversations where Zuckerberg would would berate people. He would tell people, "You can't do this. You can't have this opinion. You'd have this." And it goes and it, again, it goes beyond it goes beyond professionalism to sort of an ego driven campaign <laughs> to make people fear for their own safety. And again, I I I, ha- yeah. I feel bad for the people who will lose their money working at Facebook. I feel bad that the jobs will be lost. But but under no circumstance do I think Zuckerberg should be within five seconds of, of power over anybody. I'm and every I, time I I, I, yeah. I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't like Facebook. I find them detestable. Um, they have provided a good product at one point that did help people, <laughs> that did connect people in certain ways. But the moment the moment that product became about division is when I had an issue with it. And to Twitter's credit, to Twitter's credit, even at its worst, was never that influential as Facebook. Like, I mean, their own stupidity kept them from being influential. So, so but Facebook, yeah. Could, yeah. Fa- Facebook so, was much bigger than Twitter. I, and, and, and I would say that, oh yes. um, you know, when, when, uh, Facebook and Meta were at their height, along with Microsoft and Apple and really uh, Amazon to that extent. Like uh, all these tech companies, I, I remember you know talking about all of these companies need to be reined in a bit, and, and and by a bit I meant a lot. They they were much too influ- much too influential and much too um, you know kind of big. And to see that it didn't come through legislation, which I'm still mad about, I feel like there should have been some kind of legislation to prevent, uh, you know, Meta from going into India, setting up all of the infrastructure for the internet, and then making it pretty much, you know, what I consider a basic human right, which is access to the internet, um, making it, you know, wholly subsist through Facebook. They were so big and so powerful in so many places and really monopolistic. But to see them fall because of their own business mm-hmm. practices, I guess it gets the, like don't get me wrong. I guess it gets the job yeah. done. I think it should have been done a different way. And but I'm glad to see it happen one way or the other. I guess is what I'm well, trying to say. Uh, no, no, I completely agree with you. Um, I think the only parallel going back to Elon Musk would be like what was it? What's the um, what's the internet service that he's he's given out to Starlink? Ukraine? Starlink. 
Starlink. You know, there was a little kerfuffle a couple weeks ago where he talked about, you know, Starlink. He would <laughs> he would ask the government to start chipping in once the you know once the uh, the service was you know needed to communicate. I think they said the Ukrainian forces use like Starlink like ninety percent of all their communications, and I think he relented on that. But again, but what do you do though? I mean, who's going to provide it? Like, you're not going to have Comcast go over to India and start laying down lines. You know, I don't, I don't, I really don't know the answer to this. And I'm not trying to state, and let me finish my thought because mm-hmm. this is the last thing I want to say about Facebook. Yeah. But I'm not trying to say Facebook should go away. I'm not trying to say they deserve to go away. What I'm saying is, I think like, like Tesla, like, you know, like, like Elon Musk's um, persona, I think Mark Zuckerberg envisioned himself. I think because we did, you know, as a society, we propped him up as a Steve Jobs. You know, right. I mean, the rise of faith, like, you know, as a Bill Gates, we, we promoted him quickly. The problem is, if you look at someone like Jobs, if you look at someone like Gates, if you look at someone like Musk, these people are multifaceted in a way that Mark Zuckerberg couldn't comprehend. And when you have a singular product trying to be everything else, it's one thing to say, let me make you an iPhone, let me make you Windows, let me make you, you know, let me make you... Uh, a PayPal account. Yeah. It's another thing to say, I'm going to creep on you and I'm going to invade your privacy and I'm going to sell your privacy. That's not enough. I'm going to make you decide. It's one thing to say, I'm going to let you decide, but I'm going to make you decide it and you're not even going to know it. And that, that the, level yeah. of, yeah, that level of invasion is, should make anybody uncomfortable. All the other scandals aside, and by the way, MetaQuest looks like crap. I, 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 I think what kind of <laughs> concern? No, 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 no. You're good. I, I, I just think that what kind of concerns me is that there are com- tech companies that are being run correctly, and even though mm-hmm. Apple is, you know, kind of going through its own little woes with uh, the sale of iPhone 15 projected to be pretty low and whatever, uh, Apple and Microsoft are still as big as they ever were. They are as you know even more influential because of I think the personality, like the the cold personality behind Meta and Elon Musk, and just all of it kind of drawing attention away from these ever growing you know super companies. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't. Oh, and actually, that reminds me. Isn't uh, and a complete deviation. I apologize, everyone. Mm. But is isn't uh. Elon Musk, he said that his vision for Twitter, uh, and you've talked about super apps before. I know that uh, mm-hmm. Computer America did a little write-up about what a super app is. We don't have them here in the United States. They're much bigger over in Eastern markets and you know China, the Philippines, what have you. Uh, didn't Elon Musk say that he's going to turn Twitter into a super app? Like that's his that's his goal. I don't know. Um, I haven't heard that, but that could be true. I mean, I, I again. Yeah. This, I mean, he does have, can we just say this? He does have a track record of being transformational to companies that he's purchased. Um, I know he, I, I know he was one of the creators of PayPal in a different form, but he did buy Tesla. He did buy SpaceX. You know, these are, these are companies that he invested in afterwards. Right. I mean, we'll see what he does. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I told you my, my laundry list is very, very short. Um, I think Twitter could be a great service. I use Twitter quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm pretty prolific on there under, you know, under under different accounts but i would like to i would like it that i don't have to feel scared to publish a contradictory opinion and yeah. and i will say this i will say this and this goes for facebook too because face i think this is what got facebook in hot water um you're not entitled to be free of insults you're not entitled to be free of feeling like you don't agree and when you get online, you sort of enter this contract that you're going to experience, you're going to see things that you don't always agree with or like. And some of that is going to be worse than others. And some of it's going to be avoidable, some it's not. We have to figure out how to make this work. But, but banning people out of, out of context is not the way to do it. It's just not. And the only one that's actually actively talking about this with a dam is Musk. Trump's not going to do it. You know, whatever parlor was not going to do it. There's, a, there's like a f- like 10 other alternatives. Right. Like, I would love to see an alternative to YouTube. I would love to see an alternative Facebook. I'd like to see alternatives because competition makes things better. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. the, next, so, the next year is going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and by the way, I, I pulled up two or three different articles uh, saying that, yep, Elon Musk, uh, he wants to call it X. Like mm-hmm. just just the letter X, and he wants a super app where where he says that he wants uh, he, he thinks that buying Twitter is an accelerant to creating X the everything app, and that was uh, a direct quote from Elon Musk. Wasn't, so, 
Uh, Wasn't think, PayPal th- called PayPal mm-hmm. called X when it was beginning? I Wasn't have, PayPal called X? I have no idea. That that might be a fun trivia fact, but I I honestly have no idea about that. I, I will say though that for everyone out there who oh, does yeah, not know what was. a super app X-com. is, yeah, XCOM, yeah, by the way, XCOM. Yeah, there you go. Uh, XCOM but for everyone, was was PayPal. Yeah, so for everyone that doesn't know what a super app is, we have a write-up on our website, but long story short, think about uh, WeChat, think about uh, not really WhatsApp, but uh, Nathan, what was the other one that's used a lot over in China and other places? Well, WeChat, like, uh, WeChat's, WeChat's it. Like, WeChat's uh, the biggest one. WeChat, Weibo, and uh, there's Weibo's like one... Big. Oh, yeah, line, yeah. line's another one. Line, There's line, a- line, uh, line is another one. So well, yeah, uh, he's trying to make that for the for, for Western markets. Well, uh, there's not really an appetite for it, but yeah, go for it. Well, let me say something. WeChat is is ubiquitous. It's like Google, but ten times. The yeah. reason there are so many alternatives is because it is so much the so much uh, required. Your driver's license on there, your insurance, your rent, your social credit is that these <laughs> others were created to get away from that. So so. Um, it's like anything else. Like if, if Twitter becomes the, the super app that everything's on, then by nature, there's going to be alternatives to get away from that. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll see what Elon Musk ends up doing with that. But uh, suffice to say, as always, there's going to be a bigger intention behind that. So yeah. there's, there's that one. Um, we are moving away from meta. And of course, I think everyone can say that a lot of what the stock price drop of meta has a lot to do with the overvalue, the overvaluing of tech companies a year ago. But Nathan, a lot of it has to do with mismanagement and just, you know, kind of poor, yeah. poor management. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly so, it. so there's that. We're going to move on to another topic and then uh, we'll get into to some fun stuff. But I want to talk about Apple and uh, Apple and, and, and Nathan, like this is how I know then I'm not doing my job well enough. We, huh. we we have talked about how the European Union has said that, you know, to reduce e-waste, Apple has to put in USB-C. And they passed that legislation. They gave Apple, I think it was like two, two, three or four years to comply with this. And now that the deadline's coming up, everyone's like, Apple confirms they're moving to USB-C. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, when you're kind of forced to, like, you know, they have your arm behind your back and they're twisting it really hard. And, you know, you've been there for four years and they're finally like okay we'll do it like this is not a, this should not be a surprise right like this is obvious that apple's it's obvious this. but i think but i think it's more like apple's being compelled like usually of apple course, is, of course. is used to and i've said this on this show too like apple and i disagreed with the european situation but i completely disagree with what the euro did i i but i often do but the idea is that apple is used to being the trendsetter i mean lightning cable i'm using a lightning cable right now in my earbuds with you Mm -hmm. Um, lightning was a kind of a revolution when it came out because let's be honest, I love USB, but it wasn't a dual plug. It was single plug. They, they had a tendency to become rusty and pull out, you know, I love USB, but let's be honest. And lightning was great. It was futuristic. It was a much better alternative than the 30 pin connector that iPhones used to have or iPad. But, but the fact of the matter is, um, we have light. I mean, think about it. USB C and and Thunderbolt merged into one plug years ago. Mm-hmm. And Apple has stead- steadfast been playing with USB-C. So I want to give I want to give a little credit to the European Union, but I want to give a little credit to Apple because they have been trending towards USB-C for years. They've repl- like their MacBooks are completely USB-C. The the newer high end iPads are all USB-C. Like a lot of their other products are USB-C. Like I yeah. I think um, the only thing left was the phone because famously Apple used to be so interoperable. You had one cable, everything would work, but literally you buy an iphone now <laughs> your headphones don't work in your macbook like nothing works there there, there, so, there was a time when apple you know e- even their own products really didn't make sense they said that like if you bought an iphone and a macbook air um you know with like the one port you couldn't connect the two together without you know three adapter or two adapters or whatever it was um, um charging ports and data transfer nathan um Apple comes up with some innovative stuff, definitely. But um, is it better than USB C? Eh. Well, here's the fun part. When you buy a new iPhone now or an iPad, it actually comes with a USB C charging brick, yes. but a USB C to lightning cable. Because Apple admits Apple is so damn stubborn that they will tell you that USB C is better by by cock teasing you into giving you a USB charger, but make but <laughs> somehow resisting to make the other end a USB C. Like Apple is resisting and fighting. And I can't really support Apple anymore because they've 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 dragged their feet so much on this. So, I mean come on. 
so let me uh, go ahead and spoil the future for everyone out there. And you know, mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I found another. I think it was this one uh, saying that I, iPhone 15. I don't think it'll be 15. Uh, I think it'll be 16, uh, if anything. But this one here uh, from BGR essentially saying that the iPhone 15 Pro will get a major redesign with no physical buttons, which I completely agree with. Mm-hmm. And Nathan, I'm I'm actually putting like if I if I had to place my bets. Apple is capitulating to the USB-C because they, they, they literally have to. Their lawyers are not good enough to take on the whole EU. Uh, but I will say that they're going to capitulate until such a time that they're going to do away with the volume up and down button. They're going to do away with the power button. Sure. And they're going to do away with the USB-C charging port. And they're going to be strictly induction uh, charging. Yeah. And strictly wireless, no buttons, which is going to be great for waterproofing. It's going to be great for dust proofing. It's going to be great for, you know, so many of the phone specs, but it's going to mean but. that, yeah, they can do away with USB-C. Like, they, like, if there's a charging port, it has to be USB-C. But if there's not a charging well, port, they don't have to do crap. That's what I predict me, the future is going to be. I think you're right, but I want to add something. And the reason why Apple's been capitulating, and I think this is obvious, and I think this used to be one of those things we talked about, like, under our breath, like, oh, Steve Jobs is dead. There goes the innovation. We joked about that. No, it's, it's a fact tattooed on the butt of Apple's like mistakes. Um, I don't know if you saw the news, but Johnny Ives, who completely s- separated from Apple yeah. years ago. Well, and Apple completely did, separated. Well, he started his own firm, took on other clients, but of course his first client was Apple. So separated, I, but um, yeah. Well, I want to recommend a book to you that we actually, I think I reviewed it on the website on Pop mm-hmm. Um I don't usually recommend these books. So let me go, let me go, um, let me go find it for you. But, the story was what happened after Steve Jobs died. And, you know, you sort of want to be a fly on that wall because Steve Jobs and Johnny Ives were, you know, celebrated, you know, deservedly for creating the most symbiotic relationship in tech. Was ever. Steve Jobs the man in the machine? Uh, it was called After Steve, How Apple Became a Trillion Dollar Company and Lost Its Soul. It's right. Title oh, stupid. R- right below. I got it right here. But, um, but the, art, right the here. Yep. author is Trip, Trip Mickle. Yep. And I will say this. And did I write that? Let me see. I know I read it. Yeah, yeah, I read um, it. Okay. Nathan, yeah written by Nathan Evans. You okay, were cool. the man. There we go. But um, it's basically a sequel in a way to Walter Isaacson's uh, Jobs book because it does give you a fly on the wall and Apple is very reticent. But the, the fact is, it's one of those things where the relationship was soured and Apple did a really good public face that, oh, we're still going to work with Johnny Ives. But no, there was no intention of him working. He did not like Apple and mm. did nothing. And I think you can literally like point on a seismograph the disruption when, again, like we just talked about, when the machine stopped being compatible, when there was issues that, frankly, were bizarre. Yeah. And uh, it came out that he's completely se- six, uh, completely separated. He does no work with Apple. Mm. They made that public. And just, I think, a week or two ago, his successor just quit Apple. So when we talk about Apple capitulating, I mean, you have a company that used to be led by the most dominant alpha male in tech history, Steve Jobs. And it's been it completely gutted. There's nothing there at Apple. There's nobody willing to stand up to the EO. There's nobody willing to stand up. Like Apple, I mean, do you remember when the iPhone 4 came out and the antenna was broken? Yeah. Jobs would come uh, up and say, you're, he would and, say, you're holding, you're holding it, wrong. it wrong. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, he, and, he would, and he would call people bozos. He would insult people. And everyone would listen to everything he said because they wanted part of that. They want, because he was entertaining, like we talked about. But we tolerated that. We tolerated his behavior because the products were great. Because he did deliver the future. Yeah. And that's not the case. And that has a lot more to do with Apple's capitulation. I mean, Apple could be a forward thinking company, and like you said, the first wireless induction charger that actually works. You actually want to use it, but they canceled it. Um, yeah, I think, if you, I think you're right. It's going to be hermetically sealed, and it's going to be impossible to use unless you have voice <laughs> print identification. I mean, have you ever tried using Google Assistant on your TV? Good luck. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. It, 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 will, it will listen to you when you hey, don't want to. Hey, but Google. Yeah. Yes. Turn down volume. What was that? Turn down volume. I can't hear you. Turn down. Oh, screw this. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But I like USB C. I like USB C. And full disclosure, I kind of am relying on USB C at home because my desktop PC, um, mm-hmm. which I can talk about later, is in repair. And so I'm going to play laptop with docks and dongles. Yeah. One USB, I just ordered a USB dock. One USB dock lets me turn my laptop into a desktop, right? As opposed to like 15 USB dongles. So I love USB-C. Is it as good as Thunderbolt? No, but it's much more useful than Thunderbolt. So I, I, yeah, I, 
I totally think, and, and by the way, uh, I know people have complained about this as well. After they tackle this whole charging cable thing, I hope that they go after uh, power tools with like battery packs and, and stuff like that. Yeah, next. get rid of them. Um, yeah, those big uh, fat, power, those big well, fat battery packs. And, m- yeah. More like the lack of homogenization, the, the lack of standardization. Because I think standardization, as, as much as you know, yeah, innovation, all that kind of thing. Folks, if you want to innovate, take it to the USB commission, the council that sets the standards, <laughs> take it to them, you know, innovate on the, you know, on future standards. Homogenization and standardization oh. is, is so important for technology. I will say this. Um, you're absolutely right. That's why I love H. I love, I love standards. I love HDMI, right? I mm-hmm. love USB. I guess you'd call it A. I love those things, right? Because they, I love, we're still using the 3.5 millimeter jack, right? Yeah. But um, I, I, w- I want to say that, um, yeah, I love standardization and I, I'm a big fan of it. And anyone who can make things simple for me, I like it. I'm a very simple person. I don't like dongles <laughs> very much. I don't like, I don't want my computer to look like Medusa. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so, so there you go, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, iPhone going to USB-C, and my whole point with that is, should not be a surprise. We saw this coming, and they're finally doing it. So, there's that one. Let's uh, let's go ahead and do one more about well, kind of standardization. But you uh, you submitted this with uh, Google will graciously let Android OEMs build uh, Amazon Fire devices. And by the way, I just have to say Ooh. that. The what Amazon and and I'm a big user of Twitch. I I, I absolutely love it. I gotta say the fact that you can't really get a first party Twitch app except for on Fire TV, annoying as heck. Like this this segregation. Uh, you know you can put YouTube segregation. Well well well. Anyways, you can put a YouTube an official YouTube app on pretty much any app store out there. Uh, you know, they will release that. You can't get a Twitch app on any app store. It has to be only the Fire well, TV, the, the the Fire ecosystem. You, That's annoying to me, Nathan. Well, you remember though? You remember years ago, not too long ago, when the, they would use YouTube as leverage. Like YouTube would appear on here, YouTube yes. would go off there. They'd pull it on, pull it off. You know, like Amazon and Amazon's guilty of this quite a bit. Amazon would pull Apple products off the store if they were competing. Um, but here's the thing about this. Um, this, the reason they're doing this has nothing to do with, uh, Amazon. It has everything to do with windows. And I don't even think this article mentions it, do they? But, um, Amazon, Amazon did something that Google couldn't do. Amazon tamed Android. They made it much, much easier to use. They basically said, let's take this fork, let's chop mm-hmm. it and screw it up and make it and make it proprietary. Um, to some extent, Microsoft's done that with Chrome with edge, right? They've, They've taken over and they've made a, a, a more usable version of it that's more memory efficient than the actual Chrome. But if you own a Fire tablet, you know, not a Kindle, but if you own a Fire tablet or whatever, then you're using a forked version of Android you know, made by Amazon. And it's restrictive. It's technically Android, but it's not. Right. Although it is, it's got the DNA. And as you know, um, Windows 11 recently announced that you can use Android apps, but it's kind of misleading because you can use Amazon Android apps, which yes. means the Fire. And so, basically, not, not, not what, exactly like the full blown BlueStack support no, where you could use anything. No. Just just the Amazon ones, yes. But you but you know why that was for two reasons. One, you know they're in they're in one moderation. Amazon and yeah. Microsoft. Well, I mean, first of all, because they're safer. Because Amazon's um, Amazon's ecosystem is much much better moderated. You almost never get yes. viruses. It, they basically copied Apple's Wall Garden, and guess what? It works. It's very successful, and so. I mean, you can get a $50 uh, Fire tablet and have a very good experience as a consumer. It's not a very good creation device, let's be honest. You won't find the Google Play Store. You won't find Google Drive. But you will find pretty much all the games you want and all, mm-hmm. all the productivity things you want. So Microsoft chose them for two reasons. One, it's moderated. They don't have to worry about introducing viruses because Google doesn't do this. Google's not very good at this. I think Google's responsible for like <laughs> 99% of all online like mobile viruses. <laughs> but... Um, What's really strange is that Amazon is a competitor to Microsoft. You know, Amazon does AWS, and I think what is Microsoft's? Um, uh, they have uh, Azure. the yeah the Azure Cloud. Azure, Azure. Yes, Azure? yeah. So they're competitors, but with Windows 11, you can download and install Android Amazon apps. You go in the go in the web store right now. There's a big there's a big button for it, mm-hmm. and they work pretty well. But they're not they're not Windows apps. They're installed in a compartment. I, I what do they call it? A container. So yeah, you can do yeah, that. Yeah, container. Yeah. Yeah. And right now it's not the most super useful, but it will become useful as they become more and more. Yep. Because there are many mobile apps that just aren't available on a desktop. 
So they're, they're, they're definitely working on And by the way, the uh, um, quote from the article that you link saying that the report says that Google and Amazon have struck a deal allowing Android manufacturers to make TVs that run Fire TV OS and that TCL, mm-hmm. Xiaomi, Hisense will offer products in both ecosystems. So it's not that they're merging mm-hmm. into one ecosystem. It's just that these manufacturers can now provide you know either or well, so people can go in and buy either or. I will say this. My TV at home is a Sony TV and I do have Google TV. Mm-hmm. Um, or Android TV, I'm sorry, Google, whatever they call it. Um, yeah. Amazon has a better reputation of supporting. Like if you have an OEM phone from, that has Android on it, good luck. You don't know what's its life expectancy. You don't know how many updates it's going to get. You know this. Yeah. Amazon doesn't have this problem. Amazon updates their service because like Apple, they create the device and they do a, a symbiotic relationship. Is It's pretty good. Like the longevity of an Amazon device is actually pretty high. It's pretty good. Um, there's no resale value because it's not worth anything. But that's okay. You throw it away, get a new one. Mm-hmm. It's the first disposable electronic. But of course they would do this. Um, I think this is good news. As long as they're willing to maintain the standard, and I think Amazon retains a, what do you, the curatorship, I think it's a good really I think it's great. I do. I, and so we'll I am so cautiously optimistic, but at the same time, we have seen so so many technology ventures that, you know, promise to play nice and share and you know that kind of thing. Uh just kind of lose support and people are still actively using these devices and then hey you know the back end uh gets cut and they have a paperweight uh i i I hope that you know amazon and uh google don't have some kind of falling out again and then half these tvs don't work at all but yeah this this is a well this is a good thing as long as they don't revert well again um i made the mistake of buying the samsung tizen tv one time yeah. Never again. This is never going to happen again. I, I, it's basically, I had to exercise my house. I had to get a priest to come in and, you know, salt the earth just to get Tizen, the stink of Tizen out of there. I, I mean, I'll take Google TV any day of the week. But if I have to choose, if I had to choose between Google TV or Amazon Fire, I'd get the Fire any day of the week. I think it's a much better operating system. It's more in line, you know, it's more in line with um, the iOS experience, even though it doesn't look like it. It's just, it's a little more stable for me. Mm-hmm. So... But, yeah. I mean, that's just that's just a personal preference. So. Yep. So, okay, there's that story. Uh, let's go ahead and move over to some more fun stuff. Um, Modern mm-hmm. Warfare 2 and Bayonetta 3, some big names yeah. dropping for video games. It's a pretty big day if you're into major franchises. Um, Bayonetta 3, it's a game developed by a company called Platinum Games, released by Nintendo. Would not exist without Nintendo, so it's a Switch game. Um, it survived the little kerfuffle. The controversy kerfuffle that happened a couple weeks ago because Tur- mm-hmm. it turned out it was all all smoke no fire. Um, do you do you did I, you I, see I, that? Did you? I, I, I don't. I, I, I'll be honest. I, I heard that there was a falling out with a voice actress, or she wasn't asked, and something like that. I have no um, idea yeah. the entire controversy. I slept through the whole thing. What happened? Yeah. Well, I, um, full disclosure, every month, Corey, you know, Corey Gallagher and I do a podcast about video game sales. Mm-hmm. And we actually recorded a segment, a little behind the scenes. We recorded a segment on this, and we decided to cut it out because it just wasn't vibing with the rest of the, the fun stuff we have. We tried to keep it optimistic. Yeah. Um, and there was some uncomfortableness with mental illness. But basically, and I'm not going to say their names, but the original voice actress from the original Bayonetta games, the first two, mm-hmm. um, she, the word came out that she was not asked to come back and then she kept claims that she was offered four thousand dollars, and she asked people to boycott the game because they were not they were denying her a living wage, and she kept putting out these rants. And it became pretty clear. I mean, if you, I mean, you know, we have a tendency to to believe people, and it became pretty clear that she was being deceptive or something was up. And the developer of the game, not going to say his name, uh, said some negative things online. I think his Twitter account was shut off or banned. Um, but then it came out that it kind of didn't happen that she was offered quite a bit more money, but she refused. And I think, I think some of her behaviors uh, were in mm. line with someone having a breakdown. And that's why you have to be very careful when you do that, because you don't want to necessarily take sides or go against someone when they're clearly suffering and in pain. Um, it's true. Voice actors do not, I don't think they are protected by any type of unionization. There's no nope. protection for them, but, but at the same time, her version of events didn't, doesn't seem to be correct. And so, um, the game is coming out now, and I think anyone who wants to support someone like this, I think it might be prudent. You can support the game that you want to play, but you can support the actress maybe by donating to her or donating to a mental illness charity or or doing something in that regard. 
But uh, the game seems to be the game is getting very high scores. We'll have a review it on Popstar soon. Uh, by all accounts, it's pretty good. And there you go. If you like Bayonetta one and two, apparently you're going to like Bayonetta three. So, yeah. but I can't. I haven't played the game, so I can't report personally. So. Yeah, it, it, this is clearly you know uh, I, I know that we use the word politics, but this is this is politics, but like workplace politics, um, you know, for, for yeah, these exactly. companies. Um, exactly. And and this gets into the whole idea of you know kind of unionization, how much is someone's voice worth for the whole movie, or, or I should say for the game, uh, blah 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 blah. But anyways. It's out, and like you said, if you like Bayonetta 1 and 2, Bayonetta 3, uh, despite what the voice actress is going through, uh, the game you know the game is made with the same studio and all that good stuff. Yeah. So, there you go. Uh, and apparently it's apparently it's a lot of, it's just as good as the other, so there you go. Perfect. So, and then also Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, which <laughs> I could have sworn I played that as a kid. Uh, yeah, you know, there were. When I was 13, I don't know what it's doing getting released again. Because everything old is new again. Um, they rebooted the franchise. It's not a remake. It's a remake, but reboot is whatever you want to call it. It's yeah. the second one after the first one. Um, very, very interesting about this, though. And Call of Duty comes out. It smashes records. It's going to sell a lot. It's going to be huge. It's going to be this. It's already huge. Um, what's interesting is that I believe, I don't know if it was just the PlayStation, but if you pre ordered, you got to play the campaign early. And what's interesting about that, by the way, doesn't that logo look like a, like a monster energy drink? It makes it feel like you want to drink something. Black, black like, white, and lime green. Yes. Oh goodness! Yeah, I want to. Why are you vibrating while you're sitting down? But uh, <laughs> we, but but the fact is is that um, this is a franchise like a lot of these first person shooters that vacillates between oh we need a campaign oh we don't need a campaign oh we need a campaign oh we don't need a campaign. I'm firmly in. Please make a campaign. Please it, it I, adds to it. <laughs> You know, Modern Warfare and well, uh, well, Modern Warfare uh, in particular, but Call of Duty as a franchise, I have long since completely de- like I've played you know five or six different campaigns through them, and they're fun to you know kind of get different settings and play against AI. Mm-hmm. They're like the need for a campaign is completely separate from how good a, a Call of Duty exactly. game is to me. Yeah, they. Oh, that's the thing, though. It is an online game for the most mm-hmm. part. Everyone, most people, play, most people continue playing it. But it seems to be, it seems to need the spectacle of the campaign to drive forward because for all you intents think? and purposes, yeah, I do absolutely. And again, I, they've they've experimented with getting rid of it several times, and they always come back. And uh, its rival, Battlefield, has experimented, always comes back. Mm-hmm. And they don't. And I there was a couple of years where they just just on it was just online camp. It was online multiplayer. It was no campaigns, but they always come back. And this is one of those questions. But I think the facts bear out that. It needs the campaign for people who want to play it. Myself, I'll be honest with you, full disclosure, I don't play it online. I suck. Um, I don't have time. But I like the spectacle. I feel like when I when I play Call of Duty, right? When I play Call of Duty, I feel the equivalent of like a Michael Bay movie. I feel the yeah. equivalent of a Marvel movie. Like I'm not going to get <laughs> cinematic. Prof- I'm not going to get Martin Scorsese, This is Cinema from you know Modern Warfare. But I'm going to get a crazy, crazy story. I'm going to get full-blown spectacle. I'm going to get amazing, triumphant, manipulative music. I'm going to get characters and cool... Get- I'm going to get the video game equivalent of a blockbuster movie. And I like that. I like being subjected to that. The game is never refined that much. It's not going to be... It's not, you know, Elden Ring. You know, right. it's nothing that complex. But it's good enough, and it thrills me. And the graphics look <laughs> great, and the sound looks great. I mean, this is there's a reason this is the best selling franchise of all time. Like they do it good, they really do it good. And I'm not trying to like sell you the game, but I mean, there's a right. reason why. I mean, they do a good job with it. You know what's kind of so, funny? Uh, and and this hmm. was a this was a re- a related article to the article that we're you know kind of talking about now, but. Uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2's disc, you know, that you go into a store physically buy. Remember the last mm-hmm. time we did that, uh, is just 72 megabytes of nothing. Which I'm sure the 72 yeah. megabytes is maybe a little bit of music, maybe a loading screen, and a link that sends you to the app store to then go download the 150 gigabytes of uh, of data that is the game itself. So you go in there, buy the disc, and the disc is literally just like a hyperlink to go download yeah. it online. Uh, I'm surprised they're even still selling physical disc at this point. Um, I was having this conversation with someone a month ago, and it made me sad to agree with you on this because I love disc space media. I, you know, we have the PlayStation Five; it's disc space, not the digital. Mm-hmm. But even I have to question. What even I had to question. What, what what does it mean going forward when you have a dead medium? And the <laughs> optical medium is is pretty much a dead medium, at least the disk space. Because it's like you it's said, definitely redundant. You, yeah. 
even if you have the optical media, it doesn't do anything. It's it required. And, you know, I, I want a full disclosure. I was in Salem, Massachusetts this week, right, mm -hmm. on some business. And there is a video game store there. I forget the name of it. A video, it's a classic store. And uh, a little promotion. Um, this store was featured in a documentary, right, about video game stores. And I'll have to get it for you while I'm looking it up. Yeah. And this guy was featured. And he sells, you know, uh, give me one second. I'm going to look it up for you. Sure. This guy was featured in this, in this documentary. And I actually interviewed a couple of years back, uh, the director of this film. And so whenever I'm in, whenever, excuse me, whenever I'm in there, excuse me, uh, whenever I'm in Salem, I love seeing the store. The guy is so enthusiastic and he's got all the classic consoles, the NES, he's got Famicom, got Game Gear, Turbo Graphics, 3DO, hmm. you know, in television, Atari, you name it, the whole smorgasbord, physical media. And you can go to any store right now and they have retcon arcade, you know, they play old games, they have emulate, you know, the phys mm -hmm. ways to play physical media. Um, Sega has a Genesis Mini 2 coming out next week, you know, only on Amazon. People love the old stuff, but the problem is that has, is going to disappear. That is going to disappear because the, the optical media that's being released today is not going to run in the next yep. generation. It's going to be incompatible. Because like you said, they're basically just hyperlinks. Yeah. Because even if, you have, even if you have a game that's completely thing, the moment you turn it on, day one update, you basically re-download the entire game with the, 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 the patches. And I, you, can't, I, you won't I, be able I can't to do that. Even imagine, I can't even fathom a game that could be printed to a CD in a completed state. Like, you, you, know, you would not need an internet connection. You would not need anything else, no updates. I can't even fathom a game that isn't going to try to be a live service, isn't going to try to patch and update constantly. Like, that's that's so hard like there and don't get me wrong there are probably games that are being released like that i can't i can't even think of one off the top of my head that is strictly could be printed to a physical media without the need for an internet connection oh. to follow by the way uh the name of the documentary is called not for resale a video game store not documentary. for resale I, yeah i think i've heard of that yeah i i, I recommend you watch it it's, it's really heartfelt because there's a, there's this one episode in the store where this kid comes in they, this small town without high speed internet and all these games require like 80 gigs and he will let you bring your console in and download the updates on your console in his mm -hmm. store right because i mean i mean we, you need to think about that you need to think about these rural areas where they don't have high speed data and you can't do 128 gigs yeah. and as the need as the need for these things gets more and more and more you're simply going to have to consider bandwidth when you when every game is 300 gigs and you only have a, a terabyte hard drive <laughs> like the new playstation the playstation 5 has a very fast hard drive but it's very small it's like yeah. 800 800 gigs you know and it's just you the can way only it have is. like five I mean, games at a time yeah it's uh exactly it's it's a problem that needs to be solved so. so, so with that being said, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 releases today, um, and and did they say, like, let's see, what is the cost of that? Is that like a free Full service price. kind of thing, or is that a $50, $60 game? No, that's the... Um that's the it's full cost but of course uh, i think you're talking about warzone which is the free to play thing yeah so i, I got gotcha. uh, so yeah i i had really good memories of playing this with my friends and you know i i had a lot of fun with this uh i i guess i'm just you know not that target audience anymore um and, and also you there's some controversy be. yeah and and that's perfectly okay um there there's also some controversy about not being able to turn off cross play between pcs and consoles although if you're on ps5 you can turn off cross play that's a whole different thing that if you paid to, paid attention to halo infinite uh you know that comes into play but yeah call of duty modern warfare 2 what like you said what is old is new again so there you have like it. I said, there's sometimes sometimes there's nothing wrong with a McDonald's hamburger. Like <laughs> sometimes there's nothing wrong with just enjoying something for what it is. It doesn't have to be transcendent. It's you're not going to have some like I will say this about Call of Duty. The last couple I haven't I haven't actually played the last two two or three, but I remember mm -hmm. they were getting really crazy. They were having real, like you were in space. Kevin Spacey was the <laughs> they, bad guy. They, you know, they definitely bounce back and forth from like you know you're you're a space marine and you do that kind of thing and then they bounce back to oh yeah we're going back to world war one and then you know of course world war two as well uh trying to find what works and uh yeah modern warfare 2 always works you know that that's like today's technology today's gun so uh could be fun could be fun now nathan i wanted yeah. to wrap up this segment because we're i'm sure i'm already taking way too much of your time sure uh, but let's go ahead and wrap up with 
two different uh, podcasts that you recorded, mm-hmm. and this is for movies. You have your uh, yeah yeah I can probably show this. This is just classic trailers. Um, ah. Tell us about these two uh, podcasts that you did. Movie time, Halloween Spooktacular 2020 or twenty twenty two part one and part two. Yeah, so it's kind of a thing now. It's like I I I mean it's completely generic. So every every Halloween we've been doing spectaculars, and I have a favor to ask you: Are you Go able to listen to the beginning of it at the beginning of the podcast? There's a very fun surprise that I have there, and I just um, I just wanted to see if you could the, listen the first to the, how many like, the seconds? opening thing. The, the first time many seconds? What's that? Uh, the, like you may listen to like the first like twenty seconds. Yeah, can you can you can you guess who's on that? We have a guest we have a guest surprise done there. I want to see if you if you could do that. Hmm. It should be playing here in the background. Uh, it's the movie time. Is that the guy that did the voice for uh, Michael Jackson? You ready for this? No, that's not it. Check this out. <laughs> Curbkeeper? Hello, mm-hmm. boils and ghouls. It's your old <laughs> pal, John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is so Isn't that cool. fun? Yeah. Yeah. I, that that and 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 I'm guessing he joins you for the whole, you know, for the whole. Oh podcast? no, just just a just an intro. And uh, so he okay, just gotcha. gave, he just shouted out to our Popzara people, and he it's just fun to hear the Crypt Keeper say yes. Popzara or Popzara. But <laughs> no, it's just That's fun. Awesome. It's fun to yeah. have. So I uh, know we have two episodes. Uh, mm-hmm. We have what do we have this year? This year we have one with myself and my two movie guys, Ethan Bram and Christian Starley, and we each got to pick a, a whole bunch of stuff we liked. We I call it a smorgasbord of horror because that's what it is. It's just a little bit of this. Um, I, I played it safe. I picked three eighties movies that, that basically were more comedy than horror, but I picked mm-hmm. what I picked. I'm, I'll give you uh, mine. I'll let's give you see. You, you talked about uh, dead of night, house of wax, private eyes, terror Not train, that was trick Ethan. or treats. That was, that was, that was Ethan. Yeah. yeah, Ethan oh, likes oh, old yeah, stuff. yeah. 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 Right. And then yeah. uh, Christian takes them up with uh Let's see, a couple of other ones, Terrifier, Wolf Creek, uh, Terrifier 2, mm-hmm. The Descent. Yeah, the, uh, Nate, of course, yeah. keeps things simple with Creep Show, Killer Clowns from Outer Space Classic, and Night of the Creeps. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we had a uh, second episode with our own uh, editor-at-large, Ev Wong. Mm-hmm. And who else? we had a, a, a writer from Screen Rant, who's also a published writer, E.M. Yep. Castellanana, and they talk about J-Horror. J, uh, best cast. Japanese. Uh, you've yeah. seen the, yep. You've seen the Grudge. You've seen things like that. So, you got two to listen to, and you can't go wrong. So perfect. Yeah, they're they're both up there. It looks like uh, obviously Apple, Google, Spotify, um, Stitcher, all that good stuff. And yeah, those are always fun and very very festive as well. Uh, I, and, and and I said this on a previous uh, recording that we did today that, ladies and gentlemen, I feel your pain, especially young the younger generation, when Halloween lands on a school night. That is just the worst, and I even worse that it's a Monday. So you know maybe next year it'll be on a Saturday or Friday night. But uh, either way. I hope that they have fun. Nathan, um, any other topics before we kind of sign off and uh, and say goodbye? No, I was going to say uh, thank you very much again for having me as always. And I'm glad we could work this out, even though I'm traveling. Um, no, happy Halloween. Happy and Halloween. Have a good time. Yeah, and absolutely. And, parent, and have a great weekend. And uh, and obviously, everyone, last Friday of every month is dedicated to Nathan. We might have to do some um, uh, some moving of schedules around because next month is, of course, Thanksgiving and Black Friday. And Nathan always goes out there uh, to stand in line and wait for the largest TV that he possibly can for 50 bucks. So we'll see what happens. Cool. We'll, uh, Nathan, we'll make sure our schedules align for next month. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you have a great day. You have a great weekend and a great time. Until next time, everyone, have a great one. Bye-bye. And, of course, right. to Bridget, happy birthday as well. Until next happy time. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.